Hi, everyone, again. Thank you for joining. Um, great to have this meeting. We really love doing this. And um, even though it's four times a year, it's very, very special. And uh, we have some great cases and things to talk about. Um, let's wait maybe another couple of minutes, like a minute or two. We'll start it uh, in two minutes. Um, <clears throat> some of you who are presenting it here, um, if you're not presenting, but you have questions or comments or whatever, this is all about discussion. That's what, that's why we do this. Um, this is how we learn. So please speak up. If you're not speaking, keep yourself on mute, but if you are, unmute yourself, talk or like text, uh, write a message. If you, you know, if you prefer that way, we'll be checking that and, um, you know, we'll get to that too. So. Give us another minute or two and then we'll get going. Okay. Well, again, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's very special. You know, it's been over a couple of years that we've been doing this and still super special. Um, I hope it is for you too. I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, we have a bunch of um, cases to show. Um, some people of cases have joined, others um, are coming in. Um, and again, this is about discussion. So please. Um, have this let's let's talk if you have questions speak up unmute speak up or ask in the chat um luca can you hear me yes super thank you can you please start if you're yeah. ready we can maybe start with your case i'm the first so good, good afternoon to everybody good good morning to the rest of the world 
And I want, can you see the screen? Or good evening, is it evening? Good yes, evening. we can see the screen. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, yes. we see the, 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 yes. Lucas, the Lucas green. That's the Lucas green background. Yes. Um, ciao, here is Bergam, I'm Luca. I want to share a case of vascular spinal uh, malformation. No disclosure for it. Uh, it's a story of Marco, 62 years old man with uh, progressive paraparesis and sphincters disorders. Uh, here you could see the MR. I'll let you see the images without many comments. So, classical myelopathy with uh, perimedullary vessels. Where is the fistula? No jokes, no secrets. The fistula was at the level of the sacrum. I'll show you again slowly without many comments. AP view, oblique view, just one image. And the draining vein towards the conus that gives myelopathy and congestion of perimedullary veins around the medulla, just to find the clinical symptoms and the images on MR. Injecting the adankivids from L2 on the left side, we could see very well the artery, but no opacification of the medulla and no veins justifying again the myelopathy and the clinical conditions. These are uh, 3D reconstruction of the, of the vaso CT. And in our idea, it was a type one arteriovirus epidural fistula at the level of the second uh, drain with a draining vein in the left S1 radicular vein. I mentioned type one because the, I understand that epidural fistula of the spine are divided in two types. Type one, if you have, if we have a draining vein inside the dural sac, and the myelopathy is given by the congestion of the perimedullary uh, plexus. Uh, the type two, the myelopathy is given by the mass effect of the vessel around the dural sac. So this is was a type one. Thanks to Banatas guys. I want to resume the anatomy in this particular case. So I use the, your fantastic images of the site. These are the feeders from left iliac in, internal artery. This is the pouch. That is, is classical uh, characteristic of epidural spinal fistula. You could see in many, many uh, cases of epidural spinal fistula. These are the rest of the epidural plexus of so Batson. Uh, and this is the draining vein, the S1. Between the pouch and the draining vein, there is the little bridging vein that uh, cross the dural sheet and go inside the dural sac. We decide to send the patient to surgery, um, managing this patient as uh, it, it has a mm, more classic dural fistula to cut the feet of the vein um, on S1, uh, so to separate the epidural fistula from the dural sac, from the interdural compartment, like this. Can we, do, do you mind uh, stopping here and, uh, yeah. and have a little discussion about this decision? Um, um, you know, obviously that's an option. Um, now, any like, uh, like and you know for for spinal fistulas generally you know it's uh, it's obviously we need to have all options open right now in this particular case uh, um anything specific uh, led you to say surgery instead of endovascular or in your in your department uh, uh, you would uh, always give priority to surgery uh in my old experience um we treat most of this uh, when, when I work in Milan, in Niguarda with Dodi, ciao Dodi. Um, uh, ciao. <laughs> we treat the, the, the majority of this fistula with, uh, with the surgery, 
obtaining uh, in most of the case, in the majority of the case, the cure of the myelopathy. So I decided to do the same. And I, I think that the point of this presentation is not this, or maybe it could No, be. but it's good to have this kind of uh, discussion. I mean, that's yes, why. Yes. And uh, you know, I, I don't I, think, in my, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in going to surgery. So don't get me wrong. I just like, you know, there's different yeah. approaches. And, you know, like, so, so I was just uh, uh, at the end, you answer like, you know, essentially you give priority to surgery if that's an option. That, that's, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. But okay. because my, my history tell, told me this and because uh, before this case, I thought that um, maybe epidural fistula could be more frequent than we thought, than we know. Uh, because uh, we, we didn't found it because they are not symptomatic. So if we perform an angel, medullary angel in most of the uh, people before this case, I thought that we could find more and more uh, epidural fistula, more than, than we, we think, more than we thought before. Okay, thank you. Now, everybody in the audience, for those of you that, you know, depending on your level of experience. I think this is something that you may or may not have heard of, the epidural fistula, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of people will have heard of the dural, spinal dural fistula. And I don't think we need to talk like too, too much here about the background. You, you're not familiar, like reads, you know, there's literature, there's stuff on the Neurangio website. Um, but as Lucas said, like, it's, it's a different kind of fistula, first of all. Like the basic idea being, Again, for those of you that are not familiar, it's all about like where the seat of the disease is, like where is the shunt, you know? In the dural fistula, the shunt is somewhere in the nerve root sleeve or somewhere in the dura, usually somewhere around the nerve root sleeve. <clears throat> um, here, the shunt is really epidural. So the interesting thing about the shunt is that it's epidural, but it, um, like in this case, in Lucas' case, what happens is there is retrograde flow from that epidural shunt Thank you, yeah. Into a spinal vein, like into a radicular, a bridging, whatever, some kind of vein that then retrogradely will find its way into the, like right there, you see that big big one? That one, yes. Now, interestingly, you see how it's like a little bit off midline. So there's a lot of anatomy we can talk about here. But essentially, this is what the problem is. The problem is that vein that will find its way um, ultimately up to the cord veins and it will cause congestion. So the pathophysiology, the, the presentation and the pathophysiology is kind of similar to uh, spinal dural fistula, uh, but um, the location of the shunt is different. And that can get back to like Eitan's question of like, how do we treat them? Um, the idea is to disconnect that vein from the cord veins, not to have it, you know, retrogradely perfuse the things. But, um, the seat of the disease is actually in epidural space. Um, and they're interesting, like in your, in this case too, right? Like here, I see that in addition to the congestion of that vein, there's at least one kind of vein on the right. There's some sort of like foraminal, right? There's a foraminal vein, maybe at, um, what is it, L5 on the right side that's kind of decompressing? Yeah. Or is it is it all going into the, uh, there's like a couple of egress points, right? Where it's not just the cord. Yes. And there's some, there's maybe one down below. So it's interesting, right? It's interesting how, what you're saying, like some of them may be asymptomatic if they don't find, like, how do they find their way to that vein? Um, at what point do they become symptomatic? What do you think? Me? I, yeah. I think that yeah. we, we... <laughs> We have to go on, maybe because the discussion could be more interesting uh, if we, uh, I don't know, there are other points on this case. That, okay, uh, let's keep can, going. Can, yeah, can, mm, no, the, the problem will be the same, but the, the, what we found, uh, what we found was uh, particular. So I, I, I go on, we did surgery, we did the, and everything went, went well. And this is the angel post-op. So we got what we want. Uh, the epidural fistula was still there, maybe a little bit different, 
maybe a little bit slow, but it was the first day after surgery, that there's no more intradural drainage. This is an oblique view from the left side, just artery and epidural plexus on the right side, the same. And injecting the adenchymids, we have the proof that the, the problem seems to be solved about the myelopathy. So we could see the, the artery, the venous, the medullary uh, opacification of the contrast, and then a bit of vein. So in our opinion, it was healed, but the patient improved for a while, then had the new clinical deterioration, and again, the same symptoms. So five months later, we repeat the MR, that was quite similar, not so different, uh, justifying again the, the clinical conditions. And one month later, we repeat the angel in general anesthesia. You could see the exit, is, uh, the exit of uh, surgery. And this was the surprise. So here, there is again the epidural fistula with the pouch, the artery, the epidural plexus. Then epidural plexus was, went in another direction and appears a new venous drainage into the dural sac. It's better, recognize, uh, better to see in the oblique view. You can see here the vein that comes out from another point. The patient saw at the recurrence of the fistula in a different radicular vein, right S2. On the left, you could say the first step, uh, first prototype of this fistula. And on the right, you could see the second step and the different draining vein. Before on the left S1 and uh, the second on the right S2. Again, the resuming of the first type of fistulas, thanks to Bananas guys. But this, the, the, the anatomy was different. Here, the anatomy uh, on May was different. So these are the feeders again. This is the pouch, the point of the fistula. And again, instead of the draining directly in a bridging vein and inside the intradural S1 radicular vein, this time the, the blood goes into another part of epidural uh, plexus and in a different phenomenal vein, goes around the root, inside a new bridging vein and in a new radicular vein, S2. So the, the, the drainage did another uh, root and interestingly going inside the lit literature and studying a little bit I, I, I saw that and reviewing some case of Niguarda um, and even one another case in Bergamo we saw that this loop is another point very typical for epidural fistula so if I can do a sort of anatomy <laughs> lesson from my point of view we can recognize easier the epidural fistula if we recognize a pouch here and a, a loop around the root. Very interesting. This time we changed ideas. So uh, we go for directly for uh, endovascular treatment because we understood that was not a good idea to, to do surgery. We put a Simmons catheter in the left iliac artery. This is the injection. We mask the artery and leave the vein without uh, mask to understand better the, 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 the veins. And then we put a catheter in the left uh, iliac vein with the tip at uh, the level of the right emissary vein, L5, S1. You could see the envoy here that is reaching the foraminal vein. And we have... <laughs> A stupid uh, idea, maybe, but the stupid idea sometimes gives information that you couldn't expect before. And we could see the slowly the injection from the vein. You could see more and Why more. Stupid idea. Why <laughs> you said it was a stupid idea? No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking, Dayton. I'm joking. Uh, because not, not stupid is not the uh, uh, correct uh, term, but uh, I, um, I got, we were completely astonished when we inject from the vein. We didn't expect to see so uh, a lot of vessel, veins, artery, 
and we did the resume. So injecting from the vein, we could see the epidural fistula, the, 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 the epidural vein injecting from the fistula. Another part of the epidural plexus that you couldn't see injecting from the artery above at L5, we could see artery, the iliac artery and even L5 on the left side, we could see more and more paravertebral plexus and could see more and more intradural vein. So it, vice versa, injecting at the same time from the artery, we could see just the artery and no fistula, no veins, nothing, nothing. Summing up, <laughs> injecting from the vein, we cannot pacify arteries retroglady, uh, L5 iliac, we can opacify epidural plexus, not only the plexus draining the dural fistula, the epidural fistula. We can opacify even others intradural veins on the left of the others one here that goes independently in the epidural plexus and outside the channel well, above. And instead, if you inject from the artery, we can uh, we couldn't see the fistula and nothing. So we, we thought that we have incidentally created an included system. And after we start to think about this, and we, we know that in the normal, uh, more usual dural fistula, they become symptomatic because the blood can't exit easily from the dural sac. So what, what, I, what, I, what I mean, in, in a dural normal fistula, if the blood could easily exit from the sac, you wouldn't have myelopathy. Instead, the problem is that the, the blood comes retrogradly inside the, inside the dura sac and can't easily exit. So you have myelopathy and symptoms. From this point, can we say that epidural spinal fistula becomes symptomatic because the blood can't easily exit from the spinal canal? And can we say the epidural fistula type one have double venous problem along the dura sheets, like dura fistula, normal, and epidural spiral uh, paraspinal connection in the emissary vein, the, the outflow of the blood from the spine. And last personal three thoughts. Why we injecting by the artery, we didn't see the intradural drainage. And especially other connection between epidural and spiral and paraspinal connection plexus as we saw injecting by the vein side. Because the pressure inside the spinal canal was higher than the pressure of our injection, there are other reasons that I couldn't imagine. There are valves that works only retrograde, uh, only in the right way and not retrogradly. Um, and another point, why in other condition when we perform phlebography for other problems, like, I don't know, hip hypotension, uh, when we do phlebography or paraspinal or intradural plexus, we couldn't see never intradural vein retroglady. Why in this case we could it? Okay, if you want to stop, I, I, I will show you then the, the, the treatment. Uh, but if you want to discuss about this, um, about this point could, could be interesting unless you, I can go on and continue to about no, it. Let, let's discuss. Let's discuss. There's a fantastic case. <laughs> um, I'm happy. So, so why don't you go back uh, to the um, to the images, uh, Luca? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to the you yeah, know yeah. The, that injection from the vein. Uh, you know, I would call it a fistulogram, right? That's how. <laughs> That's how we uh, we 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 had uh, we had similar images in the brain uh, when we do a transvenous uh, selective uh, super selective transvenous uh, access, and uh, one of the features to have this is really like to have a wedge position with the catheter. So probably with that venous catheter, my guess is that you were really like in a sort of like in a wedge position. So when you inject, you were able to counter the, the, the inflow, all the blood, the, the inflow pressure from the artery. So you, you have this incredible image where, as, as you show very well, you see everything. You see much, much, much better, like the, all the venous outflow from the fistula. You see better the, 
the other supplier to the fistula that before it was not even well recognizable. And so I, you know, this is a, a beautiful, beautiful representation of uh, what's wrong. Um, uh, so um, go ahead. So we, we can we can look at uh, so, no, the wait, other. No, hold on. No, there's so many questions you raised, Luca. Um, <laughs> so one, so one question is, um, I mean, we can talk about like these functional valves, right? Like there's this concept of the valve that when the veins go through this dura, there's like an oblique kind of angle that exists um, as it passes through the dura, which ostensibly prevents the reflux from happening, right? That's the idea, is why in phlebography we don't see them. At least that's the commonly accepted notion, no? So obviously in every epidural fistula that's symptomatic, like this valve must have failed, at least in one vein, and maybe in like more than one, as you show, right? So, yeah. I mean, that's the one idea, but like these valves, they're not like, func they're functional valves, right? Anybody else have any ideas? Like what else also, is- uh, The reason why you didn't see it before is uh, like uh, there was already some outflow through the other vein. So this uh, other spinal vein, it was there already, but it was uh, draining integrally. Now the pressure is increased because the fistula doesn't have the other route to drain. So it's going to increase the pressure here and open up this valve probably, right? Yeah, but why why couldn't see it injecting by the artery, the, injecting the fistula? So you, here you could see uh, other connection between intradural vessel, intradural vein, uh, intra uh, vertebral, intra uh, spinal uh, veins and extra spinal vein. You could see here and you could see here so there seems to be that there are there some exit normal or not you don't you, you, you disagree about it yeah no i think it's a it's just a question of pressure right like what yeah I this is for me. for me it's question like of pressure. you said Eitan, and you are saying the same thing like closed system or fistulagram like it's the same thing like like ultimately whether it's artery and vein what makes blood flow is a pressure differential that's what makes liquid flow right in every single thing. So here, you're achieving much higher pressure in the venous system with the direct venous injection than you can achieve through the artery. And that's why you can see so much more. Now, I have two questions. One is, do you think all these, like you see the cord veins beautifully here, right? Um, and do you think, so do we think that we are pacifying yet more veins that, nor, that are draining into that plexus that like, might you know recur if you like say we surgerize the the one you see artery like the next one would would uh, come up or are are we seeing those like those are probably radicular veins um are we seeing those veins through the one vein that's recurred now and then we're sort of pacifying them through that vein or there are more than one connection to the to the epidural space for me the second one so. the second one okay now that leads to my second question, <clears throat> which is, um, I guess, you know, you want more. We always want more. The thing that I want more is the Dyna or Vaso CT from uh, this position. <laughs> of course. You, you are right. The next time I will do everything. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, you have beautiful ones from like from the first go around. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and I, I want to sure, also you know, like, like, this is like fantastic stuff to see you know I, I wanted also to go back to the you know you you did uh, go through it and uh, but i wanted to remark how surgery like you know it's doesn't uh, act on the fistula the surgery acts on the intradural uh, like inflow to toward the spinal canal which is the the symptomatic uh, uh, the source of symptoms in fistulas but it doesn't cure the fistula right most of the time in the thoracic and lumbar uh, or the pure dural fistulas, we don't see this sort of recurrence with surgery, but uh, this is a good example that shows like what can be like on the other side of the of the dura, like if you leave a fistula, then maybe the fistula can find another route. So yeah, you are perfectly right. I'm, I'm still surprised why uh, it's easier I, 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 for, for a, a blood red cell to pass inside the dural sac from another point after you close uh, the, the first draining vein. 
instead of pass through the L, L5, S1 uh, foraminal vein and go outside the, 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 the spinal. Uh, for me, this is not, not, uh, not clear. And I think that the problem is that there is more pressure outside the spine, uh, in the bowel, in the abdomen, in the thorax of this patient that uh, makes the blood uh, do, doing a, an easier route in, inside the dural sac instead of going outside. But this is for me the point, uh, because these images seems to me that show there are a lot of possibilities to go outside the, the spine mm -hmm. from the blood. And instead, they, they, they won't go inside the dural sac. <laughs> so you are perfectly right. The surgery pro for me is no more an option in this case, but it's still a, a big problem to understand why uh, we have this condition uh, in, instead of use a, a lot of many other possibilities to, to go outside the spine to, to use a dur um, intradural drainage for the for the fistula, and mm -hmm. for me the problem is that there is something in this patient around the spine that um, uh, something uh, linked with pressure or um, pathology of, of, of veins of the paravertebral plexus that uh, gives the pro this problem. But obviously I don't know. I don't know. I just wondering and just dreaming. <laughs> yeah. Can you move forward, uh, showing again that the arterial injection? You know, you were you you were questioning why I don't see the fistula when I inject only from the artery at this stage, right? Yeah. yeah so here, here I, you're injecting uh, from the artery and the fistula disappears. I yes. I don't know. I I mean, you had the whole run. Here we have only one image. I, yes. I suspect that the, here it's a matter of, again, hemodynamic, you know, uh, uh, maybe like uh, sort of like the injection was not as hard and we are seeing the inflow from L5. It's just a, you know, a, a, a question. Obviously, the fistula no, 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 didn't, no. didn't you, disappear. You were right. If you want, I, I can check the, the... No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's just, a, a, just one of the... I, I think, as you said, you mentioned, you said it's a sort of like an equilibrium here, a hemodynamic moment where like... You know, this is, uh, it's obviously the epistle is not cured at this stage. It's just that it's not visualized as much as, you know, I would well, say if you inject the ICA and you don't see the ACOM, doesn't mean that the ACOM is not there. You know, it may, may mean that, you know, there's a hemodynamic situation in that, during that injection that makes the ACOM not opacified with, uh, yeah, with yeah. contrast. But we don't know if this was, I mean, it's possible that this vein, like that this fistula form, like, in a way that this retrograde flow formed afterwards. Not that the connection wasn't there, but, you know, if we're saying that we don't see it now, we're presuming that there's like three or four, like whatever, like this one plus these others you saw from the vein side, all these veins are there. It's just a question of like which way they're draining. Um, are they draining anti-grade or retrograde? Can, can I say something? Of course, of course. <laughs> When I say that I disagree <laughs> about which part? <laughs> Almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm kidding. So um, it's interesting that you could see the arteries when you injected the vein, right? So that means that, of course, when you inject the artery, you cannot see the vein because you have the, the, the flow coming from the veins that, uh, occupying the arteries. So it's, it's a, of course, a matter of counter pressures. And, and I do agree that uh, it's all a problem of pressures and that the fistula uh, epidural uh, uh, injects all the veins which are epidural uh, everywhere. And uh, from there, you can enter the uh, dura if, if there is the possibility. And usually there is not. So that's why I still consider that surgery was the right thing to do at the, at the uh, original uh, case, uh, because uh, uh, the fact that you may have a recurrence after surgery is really, really, I think this is the first case I see. 
Uh, and and so, um, but surgery tells is going for sure to take care of the vein which enters the dura and goes to the spinal cord. While if you went uh, at the beginning with endovascular, you might have had I don't know onyx feel whatever everywhere in in, in the spinal in the spine. And and without really occluding the fistula and still having the the little vein going to the spinal cord, so uh, which is, we have seen many times that we when you start injecting onyx uh, uh, in this part of spinal arteries, uh, uh, you really feel you know plenty of uh, networks uh, all around the vertebra and in the abdomen and whatever, and. Uh, you are not sure you're going to get the, the vein, which is the important part, the vein that goes to the spinal, the intradural vein. While if you go surgically, you're sure you're going to get that. So I'm more concerned about the drainage to the spinal cord than the fistula itself. Of course, if the fistula itself then uh, is still there and 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 then it, it can give a second fistula in a different Vein, well, that, that's really amazing. Uh, I don't think it's it's what it commonly seen, um, and and it's it's correct to do something else now. And we will see what you did, which is will be a, a, a fantastic uh, treatment of the fistula. But um, so I, I just wanted to defend the first choice. Yeah, it, it was the right choice to me. Uh, I would say that these fistulas are, are very common. Usually, they don't give uh, intradural um, drainage. So, okay, who cares? Uh, um, they are not very commonly recognized, uh, and uh, um, often uh, um, uh, people who have this problem uh, uh, for months they go on having the problem. Nobody diagnoses. Uh, 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 the, the problem because nobody does uh, uh, the injection of the uh, epig epigastric arteries, the, the internal iliac arteries, which is, you know, of course, it has to be done. So I think we should stress this point to the people listening that when you do a, a, a complete the spinal cord uh, arteriography, you should really go to the very end, which means the sacral arteries, which means the internal iliac arteries, because otherwise you might miss uh, uh, the, the fistula and the problem. That's Either it. dural or epidural. Yeah. That's both. what he says. So most more commonly, probably still dural. Although these are, as you say, I think there's many more of them than people recognize. And sometimes they're mistaken for the dural one. Well, I forgot. And I wanted to say that to me, there was one single vein, the second one, when you see many intradural veins, they all depend on the single one coming from from the sacral, and then the rest is the we know no the network of veins which are everywhere. So if you fill whatever vein, then you you see many more veins than than you think there are. They possibly are. So I still think it, it's it was a unique vein coming from that um, plexus. The second unique vein. So, yes, yes, yes. The second unit name. Uh -huh. um, okay. A anybody right. else uh, want to comment about uh, uh, what we just talked about? Essentially, you know, surgery versus endovascular versus um, uh, and about these very, very, very interesting images. I mean, the anatomy here is fascinating. Right? Anatomy and is the fantastic. Idea that even though we understand. We think we understand the anatomy, I think, fairly well, like where the shunt is, how, what the connections are, but the physiology, like why it refers, like what happens, how come in this case, when, I think we don't really understand a lot, of course. But we know where the target is, and I think that's key. I think what we can be, like, you know, it could be surgery, whatever approach, but we know what the target is. That's the most important thing, I think, for people that are in training and this and that. You have to understand where the shunt is. You know where the target is, you know what you have to do to, to kill it. Okay. Let's kill it. Let's kill it. <laughs> I go to kill? <laughs> okay. Let's go. Let's go. We didn't wait. <laughs> 
we pass through the uh, emissary vein inside the spine, down and up till the feet of the vein. It was quite easy. And then we have another good idea, not stupid, and we inject from the microcat uh, to see better the positioning of the microcat, and we see better and better the draining vein. Maybe this could be the intra um, bridging vein here when the, the artery change diameter. And we follow the vein till the top of the conus and remember this vein. So we check the position from the artery and we start to put coils. One, two, three, four. We were quite satisfied. We inject from the artery and obviously, I don't know if it's occluded because we are, we were in the wedge position or because we occluded the fistula. So I'm joking in this case. Uh, we inject again from the microcat and we see again, we saw again the intradural drainage. So we decide to, to inject glue, a little amount, and we could see the, the cast of glue better here this is a uh, here 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 and injecting by the artery the tip of the catheter was out from the foraminal vein the fistula was occluded and again we checked the adankiewicz the adankiewicz said we could see better the the um, opacification of the medulla and the vein around the spine heal it again the patient improved we did an, um, a follow up at 6 months and the MR improves as the patient. So the myelopathy disappear, just a little bit of stain in the conus after contrast. And the fistula was, the, the, the dorsal part was normal. And we checked the sacral artery, both iliac artery, all the levels and the fistula was cured. And at the end, we check again the Adankiewicz because we like it. And another surprise, we see again the opacification of the medulla and it was correct. And we saw again this vein, in this case, anterodagradly. And that vein, this vein, was exactly the vein that we inject by, by the fistula, exactly the same. And we thought that we have occluded the outflow of this vein. And again, why the medulla should use this vein to pull out the blood when there will be, I don't know how many radicular veins that could exit from the dura sac in another part. Um, another way to put the question is that uh... Potentially, think about how many more fistulas there are, but the ones that don't use this vein are never going to become symptomatic and, uh, and, yeah. uh, and going to become to our attention. So that's all, folks. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. This is a fun, really <laughs> fascinating case. If, you're into, if you guys are into spine, this is like... Yes, the, I spent know, a lot is, of weeks to. This is <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, I think a lot of, there's one thing that I, at least I don't know, and I, I don't know if like anybody knows um, how much we, we really don't understand so much about spinal veins, like no, in a normal condition, like Armin Thron's work is fantastic, but it seems like the more we do dynas in our experience, the more we do dynas CT, like you said, like you, how do you visualize spinal veins? You can't visualize them well unless you inject the arteries because, you know, or, or you have like a fistula like this. But in a normal state, you have to inject the artery, you see the vein, and there's a lot of variations in the arteries. But the more we see the veins, the more it seems like there's like huge variation in the number of normal radicular veins. Like if you take cervical spine, some people have them, I don't know, five, six of them, almost at every level. Others, completely normal people, like incidental, like done, Dina done for, no re for other reasons. Maybe there's one there that we can see. And the cord is, seems well injected. 
like you see all kinds of cord veins, uh, intrinsic cord veins. So we see there's veins injected. So I think there's a lot of like, we really don't understand that too much, I don't think. Um, and it has to do with the fistula because the fistula, the symptomatic fistulas don't have drainage, right? They have like a lot of congestion, like what you were saying at the end, like why is this continue to use this vein? Well, obviously because for some reason it needs to use that vein. It doesn't have other good veins. If it had other good veins, it would have probably used them before and wouldn't have been symptomatic as Eitan said. So there is like, a, I think there's a lot more work on normal anatomy that has to be done to really get into these things. I hope um, that we never found uh, the answer because <laughs> I'm, so into, I'm so curious that uh, it's so interesting that I hope that we, we could never find a, a really answer. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I I still like, you know, I mean, I, I it's probably like <laughs> being, I still love so much the way you ended up treating this. You know, it's simple. I mean, honestly, I think it's safe. You know, the, the, the distance to the, to the spinal cord from these veins, it's so long. You know, it's safe, it's simple, it's effective. You know, honestly, when you show me the two things, it's hard for me to look at this and say, yes. So, uh, if I have a case like this tomorrow, I'm gonna give priority to surgery. Don't you try with the by the artery? What do you say? But it, it's it's possible to try even by the artery side. Uh, oh no, I think in, there's different ways to do it. I think you can also do a transarterial. You know, the the Adamkevit is pretty far away, right? I I think there's a way to do this transarterial too. I mean, I would add even. I mean, I don't know if this was anterior or posterior epidural, probably anterior epidural, right? Anterior, anterior, anterior. anterior epidural. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, there is also an optional direct approach to the venous sac. You know, I, I don't know. But I, I would certainly like give priority to these options rather than uh, surgery. Uh, I mean, and that's good why we're, that's why Nurair is so interesting. We have so many different questions, we have different approaches. One last point to mention is we're going to see a lot more of these approaches now that we're using them for CSF venous fistula, right? Like this is coming up much more and more. And, and that uh, honestly, like that's a way that I think uh, is going to lead to more and more understanding of these veins, you know, uh, doing these venographies for that, like more and more, that's going to lead us to understand this anatomy more. Max, there is a, there is a question from Sri, uh, two questions, actually. You want to read them? Uh, oops, sorry. Oh, why don't you? I what is wrong with my thing? So Sri um, Sri is asking, uh, was a transarterial approach embolization doomed to yield incomplete fistula cure in this case if the venous pressure were greater than the arterial inflow, if elected before initial surgery? I think not. We haven't approved, but. I think it, it, it could uh, it could work uh, the same. Yeah, I think to... once once you're in the arterial aspect of it, I I think I I think that's that's not a limitation. Um, uh, and then there is another question: Should we think about transvenous approach from the get go if such pathology is seen in the future, or did the postsurgical change result in a change environment and increase venous pressures, making transvenous so effective now? My perspective is that transvenous approach would have been as effective from the get-go. Granted that the fistula sac would have been reached. Yeah, the, the problem is uh, uh, that getting to the pouch in this case was not so difficult from the vein, but most of the time, it's really difficult, the navigation and the catheterization of veins uh, in the spine. Well, really, it can be difficult. Of course, when they are dilated, it's easier, but um, uh, very often you are in, in, in the middle of, of, of a forest of, of veins and you start going right and left, up and down, and, and you really don't find uh, the, the, the right route uh, to, to, to your uh, target. So it's not that easy to not to catheterize the veins in general, True. and especially in the spine. So um, True, but can I can I say a but? My but is uh, it may be not that easy, but 
it's well, it's a, yeah. relatively yeah. safe, right? I, like you I know, know the, having a problem navigating the epidural plaque. So I'm sure. I mean, Dolly, with your experience, you're gonna say, yeah, that happened, that happened. But I would say, do you agree that in the big uh, scheme, that navigating these veins is relatively right. safe? Well, I would say in the big scheme of things that most epidural fistulas actually don't have other outflows. They're just like, there's more of a spectrum of them. Dural fistulas pretty much always drain into this one vein. Epidurals, sometimes this and that, but a lot of them don't have other outflows, which is another fascinating thing about them, I think, is like epidural plexus is so connected, but sometimes it's not. So I think most of the time we don't have the transvenous rod because we don't, we don't know where to like look through like a through some occluded vein or non-existent vein, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just this pouch, and then the pouch drains into the spinal vein, and so then you either have direct stick or arterial or surgery. Um, any anybody anybody else? There is an echo coming from some microphone. I don't know who's okay. No, no not anymore. No. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, yes, Luca. So Fantastic much. case. This is like super. Thank you. I'm happy. Um, I'm happy. Very happy. <laughs> very, very. Patient is um, the happiest of all of us. <laughs> I'm very um, happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, next, we have more cases. We are like took a while, but it's an awesome case. Um, um, Mohammed, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Super. Okay, let's. Um, why don't we? Um, let's go with your case because you you have we have a fistula and then we'll switch gears back again. We'll go back to the spine. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Lucas. Great case. Um, I'm gonna show something a little bit similar, but not obviously as complex as the spine. So uh, it's a 40 year old male who presented with left-sided postal tinnitus and uh, he's ultrasound technologist. And every time he put the ultrasound the probe over his left mastoid bone, he said, well, the, the, he saw something vascular and he compresses and the fistula or the, 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 the noise is gone. So he, you know, partially diagnosed himself. So we started, he got a CAT scan and MRI. I'm just showing here the CAT scan. So the CAT scan and MRI were uh, basically uh, interpreted as unremarkable. This is just a few cuts of the CAT scan I'm showing here. Um, the only probably finding here, we can see that there is a large mastered emissary vein here that you can see on the left side. Um, it's a little bit probably four to five millimeter. Um, again, another uh, cross-section of the MRI, this is T1 post-contrast. Um, also, we can see this large mastered emissary vein here on the left side. But other than that, it was interpreted as negative. Um, so we brought him to the angiogram for, uh, this is a left ICA injection that I'm showing here on the left side. You can obviously see that it's pretty unremarkable, except of, again, we can see this uh, um, large massive emissary vein on the left side, but other than that, it was the left ICA was unremarkable. Um, so this is a little bit of uh, oblique view uh, zoomed into this region, and we can see that uh, the same finding basically uh, left uh, massive emissary vein that it's enlarged. So just to reproduce what the patient was, we asked the patient to just compress over the area that he was uh, telling us about. You can see his finger over the left mastoid prominence here. So this is the angiogram after the compression. You can see here that basically you can see very nicely that uh, uh, we don't see anymore the emissary vein that he uh, we are seeing and the left sided uh, or the drainage of the left sided hemisphere is basically through the vein of Labe to the transverse sinus. Uh, this is the well, other... Can I interrupt you? Of course. So, um. Obviously, we don't see the emissary vein, but there's something else we don't see here either. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so we don't see the sigmoid and the jugular vein. I'm not sure if this is what you meant. That's what I meant. So yeah. what do we think? Like, how do what do we how do we decide what's the problem? Exactly. That's exactly the point. Uh, so uh, obviously, initially, we're like, you know, biased or we're like, okay, well, this is the emissary vein that's causing the problem. But the fact we did not see 
uh, upon compression, we don't see not only, you know, why the flow did not continue to this, the sigmoid sinus and obviously the jugular, the jugular vein, but here, this is very interesting. So uh, we see that the flow has somehow reversed and there is, or there's competing flow from the other side. And this is exactly the point. So um, obviously this is just the same view before and after, and that's what uh, Max is saying. So when we compress over the, the, the method, the mystery vein, the flow ideally or normally should continue through the sigmoid sinus and go to the jugular. And even here you can see a little bit of tapering, but you can see that the jugular vein is not as dark as the, uh, or opacified as the sigmoid uh, sinus. And after compression, everything ha has disappeared here. So obviously here, this is very important point that what's missing, that's your point to your point, Max, obviously the ECA run. So when we did the uh, ECA injection, uh, you can see here, obviously, this is a fistula. And um, so this fistula is not uh, the typical location of a dural arterial venous fistula. It's obviously here located or centered this uh, occipital bone, not in the typically we see them in the transverse sigmoid junction. But here, this is a little bit lower. And we can see that the uh, uh, that the, uh, the the main feed the main feeders are from the occipital artery, which we see here, the posterior auricular artery, and you can see on the AP view very nicely that one of the main feeders is the ascending pharyngeal artery, which is uh, you see it very nicely here, mainly the neuromeningeal trunk of it, not the anterior one going to the pharynges. So obviously this is very important that. Uh, uh, this is the that explain the competing flow uh, uh, through the left uh, distal sigmoid sinus and uh, jugular vein. Um, so here again, as I said, it's not really very typical for the transverse. So you, also you don't see any feeders from the middle meningeal artery, uh, which is typical in the transverse sigmoid sinus fistula. Um, so here the question, the other question is how we are going to manage this fistula, uh, given that usually we use the middle meningeal artery or the occipital artery, but obviously with, especially with the feeders from the ascending pharyngeal artery, which in this location, we know that there are a lot of cranial nerves in the jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal. Um, so if we look a little bit carefully let's, here. Okay, let's, let's go back a little bit, if it's okay. Um, so first question is, Probably, was there an MRI done before the uh, angiogram or just the MRI with contrast? Just the MRI with contrast. Okay. Presumably, we would have seen this in an MRA. Um, sometimes, you know, especially in the bad places, the MRA starts like mid-head somewhere. You know how they cut off like half the cerebellum. So it's possible to miss that too on an MRA. But a, an MRA that would have gone below the skull base would have, I'm sure, picked that up. Now, second question is this. Uh, I guess we'll get back to this mastoid emissary vein, which is a red herring, right? But now, how do we explain, so, you know, the, the tech puts his, you know, ultrasound probe over the area, pushes, and the sound disappears. So the natural question is, did we do the same compression from this injection and see what he's compressing on the artery side? Because presumably the reason he's not hearing it is either because he's compressing the vein or maybe because he's compressing his occipital artery. Correct. Do we know? Yes, that's a great point actually. And we will come to this later, but let me show you where he was compressing. Uh, and I think we know that it's compressing probably, uh, and I, I was actually uh, in the introduction, I did not say it completely resolved. And probably I said resolved, but it was just significantly decreased. So it was not completely resolved. Uh, that's, you know, one thing. The other thing that, um, that, that this is his finger, right? So it's, this is the, the mastoid tip. And I don't think, so usually the mastoid artery is medial between like, you know, between the styloid and the medial to the styloid and the mastoid. And it was basically compressing, you see the tip of his finger, you see it actually better on this images here. So, right, so this is the trajectory of the occipital uh, 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 mastoid emissary vein. And this is his finger here compressing exactly over this area. So I think, I think he was compressing uh, uh, the occipital or actually not probably the occipital, the posterior auricular vein, which is the outflow 
of the mesoid emissary vein in the suboccipital region. So he was, I do think that he was compressing the vein here, the outer flow of this vein, not necessarily the occipital artery, which is a little bit deeper. And the other answer to your question, he was not, he was not completely resolved. So it was decreased when upon his compression. But those are very important points that we will discuss a little bit about uh, them at, at later part of the presentation. I mean, it, it could be, it could be that by compressing that vein, um, now the fistula cannot drain anterogradely in the internal jugular vein anymore. It drown, it, it drains retrogradely, uh, like up uh, uh, toward the sigmoid sinus, toward the the left transverse sinus. So indeed, if you go back one image, you see there's sort of like there seems to be inflow in the region of the sigmoid up higher. Uh, no, when during the compression at the yeah. level of the labe, there is inflow. I think that inflow is the retrograde flow from the fistula that instead of going down, it goes up. And, uh, you know, and this maybe this inversion of the flow that this uh, small compression caused um, is enough to, to cause this, uh, this uh, tinnitus to be gone. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, it's for sure that we don't see any flow here, but there's blood, right? So this is for sure a retrograde flow at this point here with washout. But I, I do believe, even though it's red herring here and it's not like the direct or its consequence, but a significant flow through the mastoid emissary vein, which is closer to the cochlea and to the, sorry, to the mastoid air cells, it also could explain, I think we treated uh, cases with completely just occluded this in patient without fistula and its symptoms completely disappear. So increased or accelerated the flow through enlarged mastoid emissary vein can per se in, uh, cause a postal tinnitus, but uh, obviously here, this is not the, the primary pathology, right? Uh, um, so, uh, but we'll, we'll touch base on those things at the later part of the presentation. But so here, I think the other important point that uh, how do we, how we are going to approach this fistula, given that uh, the feeders, the arterial feeders are obviously uh, um, not as uh, with not without risk with the cranial nerves in this region. So we decided to go transvenous. But before we uh, we really have to understand this, uh, we were just discussing about the uh, the venous importance of the venous approach. We decided to go transvenous because if we look carefully on this on those images, so we can see obviously the occipital artery with the with some of the feeders, transosseous feeders. So this is. A, possibility to go through, but obviously it's a little bit far from the center of the fistula and it's uh, not the posterior auricular artery is another option, but again, we have the styloid, uh, mastoid uh, branch and the ascending pharyngeal artery is also a very high risk. But if we look a little bit more carefully, and this is the venous drainage, we can see that um, the, the venous collector or the, the vascular collector of all those feeders, if you can, uh, this is the pouch, the venous pouch that it actually just connect the, the shunting points that merge or collect together before it jetting into the jugular vein. So that was the real, if we can get this, this you can, as you said from, from the prior presentation, you can kill the fistula if you can just uh, uh, shut down or kill this outflow or the collector before jetting into the main. And with that, uh, you can preserve or uh, save the, the, the sinus. So that was the target for us to target this collector that it's between the fistula and the main drainage vein. Uh, again, this is just a dedicated uh, injection of the occipital artery. You see all those feeders, but eventually they will collect or merge together uh, to give, and this is the connection, the fistulous connection. I'm not really sure if fistula here is, but this is really before everything coming from the occipital artery is jetting into the, the jugular or the sigmoid here with this very tiny um, uh, inflow. Um, uh, we see exactly the same thing from the dedicated ascending pharyngeal artery injection. You can see here, this is the arterial injection of the ascending pharyngeal artery. And this is the neuromeningeal trunk and do all these feeders eventually will collect into this before they drain into the uh, uh, cervical jugular vein. So that was the, uh, if we can get to this pouch, uh, and you can see here that uh, we, I do think maybe there's another one here, but I do think this fistula is compartmentalized. So because there, there are somehow difference uh, uh, between the, 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 the outflow between the, from the occipital artery and the ascending pharyngeal artery. 
Um, this is obviously not as nice uh, a dynasty that uh, it's not as nice as your uh, uh, your dynasty, but we can actually see all those angiographic findings. We can see them. So first, you can see here that this is the the outflow of the. You can see it here. The outflow of the the ascending pharyngeal outflow. This is uh, uh, you know this is the condyle. So basically, this is condylar uh, arterial venous fistula. So this is the occipital condyle here, and all the feeders will eventually come together and this is the venous outflow here from the ascending pharyngeal one. And if we look a little bit more posteriorly, this is the uh, the sigmoid sinus here and this is the outflow from the fistula to the uh, sigmoid sinus here. I'm not sure if it's showing, it's uh, uh, reflecting in your screen, but this is, uh, uh, you can see also the difference between of the, the contrast density of the venous outflow of the fistula and the sigmoid sinus, and you see the jet flow, the high contrast coming from the fistula compared to the a little bit less contrasted blood coming from the sigmoid sinus. So this confirmed that uh, we do have this uh, venous uh, pouch before we get into the, the transverse sinus. So here, I'm uh, just showing it another. So this is the occipital artery here. So I think the patient was compressing. Uh, this is the mastoid, uh, mastoid, uh, mastoid prominence. The patient was compressing from outside, but the occipital artery is more from inside. Um, can you show the can you show the fistula again on this? Uh... Yes. So again, I do think that there are two compartments of the fistula. One is the sigmoid. Uh, so this is the sigmoid uh, uh, sinus here, and this is the venous outflow from the fistula. No, the venous outflow, and that you showed it very well. I'm saying yeah. really, but you're saying that's vein already, right? So where is the fistula? Well, the fistula, obviously, I mean, we see all those arterial feeders. I think those are like the shunting point. Uh, obviously, this is not very high resolution as your your images. Eaten. No, no, it's it's very good, actually. I And, yeah. uh, you know, it's extremely useful. The reason why I'm asking you is because I did, uh, you know, have uh, similar cases in the past. And, uh, you know, as 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 much as I, I agree that I would call this a dural fistula here, when I look at this image, right, it's hard for me to put the shunt on the dura. So that's why I'm asking you this specific question. I'm not yeah. uh, uh, arguing on how to call this because I would also like call it a dural fistula. But now that you're showing the the cross sectional, you know, it's hard for me to put the shunt on the dura. That's why. Well, actually, we had this discussion with the radiologist, the diagnostic radiologist who read the imaging. We'll come back to the diagnostic imaging that all the findings were seen on the CT and MRI. And we ended up calling it intraosseous fistula or condylar fistula, but I totally agree. It's not necessarily centered in the dura, like surrounding the transverse or sigmoid sinus, as we see in the transverse. It's more intraosseous. And I think this is this is really showed it here very nicely. And we'll see on the MRI that retrospectively we were able to see all those findings. But I do think that the fistulous points are located either in the, the bone. And this is, I think, uh, was the title was intraosseous fistula. I, I do think that those are intraosseous uh, fistulas and not necessarily like the dural. Uh, that, uh, but I, I, back to your question, I think those are the feeders, and you see the shunting points. I think we see some of them here. They are literally between in the bone between a small dural. Uh, those are arteries, and this is the venous outflow. So I think those are intraosseous. To your point, and this is very nice example here that even posteriorly actually you see it a little bit more you see the you see all those this is an arterial feeder those are arterial feeder and they jet into within the bone they connect to, into this vein um thank you but, yeah no that's a great point um so um Again, we'll go back to the fistula and then we'll kill the fistula from the uh, venous side. It was relatively very easy. I think you can see here just with the diagnostic uh, uh, catheter, if I French, uh, I think, um, so we were able very easily, uh, relatively very easily to go inside this pouch. Um, and I just, I think I placed an, a scepter balloon, just, you know, just wanted to preserve the sinus, which I don't really think it's necessary, but it's better to preserve it. So here you can see, this is actually was an echelon microcatheter, just in case we coiling or onyx, you can see the proximal, the distal marker, the proximal marker. And um, this is the microcatheter run 
just showing this venous collector before jetting into the jugular vein or the sigmoid vein, you can see here the, the balloon, the scepter balloon. Um, this is the scepter balloon just at the outflow. The microcatheter is somewhere here and the buried inside. And you can see here it's really uh, uh, in the bone. Uh, uh, again, this is just the same finding. And then we started to inject it. Uh, we decided to go onyx first here because uh, we just wanted to kill all those feeders. I'm not really sure it's necessarily if you are in the venous pouch, but here we knew that there was no uh, um, cranial nerves or the area is not very high state like the. Um, so we just, you know, kept going with the onyx. You can see all those feeders in within the occipital bone. Those, those were a little bit far from the condyle. Uh, but eventually, I think I had to inflate the balloon, the scepter balloon, just to get more penetration. Again, I don't know if that was really necessarily, but at some point you start see the onyx going to the occipital artery. And this is actually the occipital artery. You can see here how the occipital artery is filling uh, with the onyx. Um, I think at this point decided to stop uh, uh, from this side. Again, you see this, you know, part, the posterior part of the fistula is gone. Um, but still, obviously, the anterior and the medial part of the fistula is there. And then here, when we look to the AP view of uh, post-onyx embolization, you can see that the main residual part of the fistula is through the ascending pharyngeal artery, uh, which is, this is the segmentation or the compartmentalization of this. So it was also relatively very easy. We just decided to do the same thing. So actually, what I did, I just pulled the scepter balloon all the way to the jugular vein and pushed it into this main collector vein before uh, getting. Um, so again, this is the, uh, again, a controlled angiogram of the ascending pharyngeal artery showing that the residual fistula is mainly from the APA. And uh, this is a highway to get there. So we just pull back the, the scepter and re-advance it to the, uh, to the venous pouch. So this is just the scepter and you know, it's right there. So here uh, I decided actually to do, uh, uh, coiling instead of the onyx, because we knew that this is the area of the jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal where the neuromeningeal trunk of the APA were a lot of cranial nerves here. So here we decided just with the scepter balloon to just to start to uh, place some coils. And it was, you know, just a few coils uh, um, and everything is gone. So this is the control angiogram. This is just the unsubstracted view. And this is the ECA run showing that complete cure of the fistula. This is the CCA run. So it was easier than uh, we expected, but again, it's just uh, uh, knowing that, and this is uh, this is to max point. So I think here, after we uh, treated the fistula, you can see that the flow has already spontaneously disappeared through this uh, uh, mess with the mystery vein. This is before where the, the flow, because of the competing flow in the distal sigmoid and, uh, uh, and the jugular vein here, there was competing flow from the fistula, so the flow was diverted through the emissary vein. But when the fistula is occurred, you can see that there's no more flow through the mass of the emissary vein. There was actually, I did, not, I did not show those images before, but there's also some contribution of from the, uh, uh, some muscular branches of the, of the vertebral artery that also has disappeared. Uh, uh, um, so here, I'm just gonna go back to the MRI and retrospectively looking back to the MRI. Obviously all the findings, uh, uh, their retrospective is much easier to see them. And this is the uh, this is this is the occipital bone. You can see this is the uh, obviously the prevertebral muscle here. This is the occipital bone. You can see the enhancement and the uh, and the condyle. And you see a little bit posteriorly. This is part of the occipital or the condyle occipital bone. You can see this abnormal enhancement and all those feeders coming to it. Um, this is just I'm comparing. This is the dynasty after the coiling, and exactly this is the pouch, the venous pouch that we were targeting. Now it's obviously occluded with the coil. You see some onyx here in this region. Uh, also retrospectively, this is before embolization. You can see that the prominent, probably occipital artery, you see the contralateral occipital artery here. It's a small, and this is on the left side. And all those uh, abnormal feeders going and with abnormal in intraosseous enhancement that uh, correspond to the fistula. 
So a few learning points that throwing so emissory veins are a normal variants, but can be dilated or enlarged in intracranial hypertension, jugular stenosis, or a dural fistula. And again, even though they increase the flow through the emissary vein can cause symptoms, but they are most of the time, they are not the primary pathologies. Um, um, six vessel DSA is very important. I think we almost like, oh, uh, I think the patient compressing and, you know, we're just biased by the emissary vein, you know, uh, and I was, I think I was doing the diagnostic angiogram from radial and, you know, I was, you know, about, uh, but ECA injection was the key here. Obviously this is uh, very important. Um, uh, MR, the, the fistula are very difficult, especially those at the skull base are very difficult to diagnose on the cross-sectional imaging, but the dilation, the dilatation of the uh, occipital or meningeal arteries or any ECA branches and the intraosseous enhancement, those are usually the clues to uh, diagnose fistula on, the non, uh, on cross-sectional imaging. Um, uh, for EVT for all fistula, I think there's a, a great paper by uh, Itan, Max and Itan published in AJNR a few years ago. They, they talk very nicely and they explain this about the vascular collector or the venous collector. And if you find this, you're, this is the, the easiest and the best way to, to kill the fistula. I think this is very important uh, 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 understanding. If you want to really understand, this is a great paper. Um, and coining instead of onyx. Uh, so just one thing, the patient obviously wishing sound completely disappeared after the first level, but just the next morning, he was complaining of uh, some, uh, he described it like he was not feeling his, like, or like, you know, uh, uh, some sensation, a problem in the hypopharynx. I think this is probably related to the cranial nerve, the hypoglossopharyngeal or the hypo, uh, uh, maybe the glossopharyngeal was just describing like numbness in his pharynx or not feeling his pharynx when he's eating. It was very transient. It was not bothering him. And I think I started him on some steroids and those symptoms disappeared a few days after like one week uh, after the procedure. I think the other important point here that coining, may, maybe we don't need onyx if you are, if you are in this venous collector, probably uh, coiling is just uh, um, enough to, to kill those fistula from uh, from the venous side. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. This is uh, awesome, uh, Mohammed. Um, a really nice case and uh, beautifully um, illustrated. Um, I mean, it shows how, you know, um, if you go to the details of the fistula and not just, you know, just have, looking at it superficially, you can find ways to treat that are uh, much more elegant and safe, you know, because uh, here, you know, I think you treat it in an extremely safe way um, and, uh, you know, much, much safer than just going to the iron and injecting some liquid embolic. Um, so I think, I think th this is one of the, one of the, in multiple interesting points about the case. Um, Max? No, it's an awesome case. And uh, we talk, I mean, there's, there's so, so much we can talk about, pulsolotinitis in general and this and that. Uh, this, the unusual, like we already discussed, that this is not really a dural fistula. Um, and I think we just have to be open to that, that some of them are really, unless maybe we could, anybody disagrees. Um, is there any, do we have a discussion? Like some people say it's osteodural or just osteal. Um, okay. No uh, my, my, I'm Dodi again. My um, question is uh, a very beautiful case. For, uh, first of all, Mohammed, uh, really <laughs> very nice, very well uh, studied, and 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 that's the, the the key factor of having a good treatment and very good. So finally, there were two veins, right? Uh, uh, with two different uh, sides of the fistula. So uh, so it, it, there were really two AV fistulas uh, separated, uh, uh, and uh, it, but in the same general location. Uh, so this to me is a little bit interesting because uh, uh, usually when you have a, an AV fistula, you have, you know, an artery, some something happens, and then a vein. It could be direct hole or with something in in, in between. Uh, 
but then it's the, the, the it's one thing it's one one vein finally which is the important part of the fistula um but here you have you know like kind of a twin fistulas <laughs> uh, and and i don't i don't understand if it's because uh, uh, really, there are two different things in the same location, and and so why should it happen, or uh, they may be uh, um, started in the same point, and then the two veins diverged from the same original point. Uh, that's that's my question. Finally, maybe I did not understand uh, this point. Mohammed, you're muted. Mohammed, you're muted. Oh, so, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, this is something we we know if there is venous thrombosis or the vein is abnormal, we may expect multi multi fistulas. But for this case, I mean, it was very obvious. We obviously did not know that beforehand. But after we treated, uh, we treated the first part, and the other part was like complete. Uh, uh, even the venous drainage was not even the sigmoid sinus, the one of the ascending pharyngeal artery. So I'm showing here, this is complete separate uh, arterial feeder, venous drainage, and ultimately in the jugular vein, it's really in the, in the up in the neck. And this is, that was completely different than the, the one from the occipital uh, artery. And the veins is here, you know, not like thrombose vein. So um, uh, we, we don't understand, right? Most of the fistulas that, you know, sometimes we see the venous thrombosis, but most of the causes we don't know, he was like, Man in his late thirties or early forties, um, I don't know. What's how do you explain this? Uh, this multi 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 fistula that they are very close to each other, but treatment and imaging wise, they were basically separate. I find it interesting that like whether they're dural or osteodural or whatever they are, or brain AVMs, maybe even like as we're saying. A lot of arteries, a lot of stuff going on, but on the vein side here, very interestingly, there's two, right? Separate drainage and everything, but there's still like the number of venous collectors is limited. And we have so much like success, you and many others in targeting these things. Um, obviously like brain AVM is all kind of different story because you have to really get the nidus part, but really at the vein side, like there's so much vulnerability to them. Um, now, there's a couple of comments in the discussion here. Uh, Tibor, um, so Tibor is saying, if you look, he says, I embolized 20 times through the ascending pharyngeal artery without a single complication. Particles in BCA, onyx, whatever. Do we want to talk about that? Like the only, in fact, the only complication we've ever had well, in a... <clears throat> It, it, it was I just remembered one case where where we put a stent in a, a, a low down in the sigmoid, and probably co that caused the compression of a hypoglossal nerve or something. But uh, she had a um, she had to have a um, what you would call it a peg for six months. But I, I understand that, you know, I, I was, I mean, I, I do worry about the hypothetical of injuring cranial nerves. It just hasn't happened. We used to do a fair amount of uh, globus tumors um, with, with particles and, um, and, you know, and all kinds of, and all the dural, dural fistulas. And it just hasn't, it just hasn't happened. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just a lucky bastard, but... Uh, I just haven't seen it happen. Uh, that was very interesting for this case. I, I mentioned that this patient had very typical, is like other than the whooshing sound was, but after the procedure, he described something in the hypopharynx. I mean, this is even with treating from the venous side and with coining, and he described some, I, I don't remember exactly, like difficulty swallowing and some sensation problem. So I would, especially with this one, like the foot of the fistula or the fistula's point, or I don't have this unsubtracted images here, but it was exactly in the jugular foramen where the nine and the 10 and the 11, uh, I would definitely be worried of going that 
distal into the, I mean, probably glomus tumor may be a little bit more proximal here than there are some, but for this one, I think transarterial probably um, is, I, I would not do. I so is it possible that precisely that fact that, that, that you used coiling and that, you know, that creates a mass effect and precisely that, that's what the problem was? Well, of course, yeah, this is obviously a possibility, but, uh, but you know, I was actually not very crazy with the coiling. It was just literally, and you can see it's just going here very smoothly and just that, that pouch that it was through a scepter, you know, I never used scepter to put coil. It was just, you know, um, uh, but obviously I started him on steroids, very low dose steroids, just, you know, I expected that there would be some mass effect, but I mm -hmm. think. Um, but the coils are not in the jugular foramen. Correct. Are correct. They? Yeah. No, there are. There are. Oh. I think it's in the posterior condylar fossa. You can see it actually on this image. Uh, posterior con. Uh, they are. They are uh, a little bit um, posterior uh, and medial to the. Um, I think the jugular vein. I don't think they are in the jugular fossa. They are intraosseous. I think they're probably the posterior condylar canal. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's very yeah. interesting. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, yeah. criticize yeah. anything. I'm just saying that that uh, that uh, fear of cranial nerve damage from embolizing in the ascending and pharyngeal hypothetically is there. I just, you know, as I said, I I mean, Max, correct me, but do you, do you have you ever oh. seen it happen? I, I mean, you trained me. I've seen so <laughs> many of them. And I think I would say the vast majority of what we, we were doing um, were like contour uh, particle embolizations, um, yeah. right? Um, which I I happen to believe that the contours are particularly like forgiving because they're aspherical. And so they do cause thrombosis without too much, like I don't know if they're maybe not so effective at occluding um, vasonervosum. nervosum. And that's mm -hmm. just a theory. I mean, that's been proven in the, uh, with the uterine fibroids, that the spherical ones shrink them more because they necrose them better. But um, um, I, now I haven't, you know, we have not embolized through those in a while with like liquid embolics. I've seen a couple of complications from other uh, places. Um, with, I mean, I, you know, I had a complication from a case like this. You know, it, it was a different one. Um, but you know, let's don't let's not forget there is a potential communication between these vessels and the the vertebral artery and yeah. the, the brainstem vessels. So so that's also another. It's not just the risk. I think of the transarterial embolization is not only the the cranial nerves. Is also that potential co communication that you may see or you may not see. But that's 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 maybe very. Absolutely. So come, it comes to mind, we did have one complication at Bellevue, if you remember, through the foramen uh, ovale in a V2. Remember, it was a, that was a yes. yeah. cavernous yeah. sinus fistula that we're taking a glue shot yeah. and uh, that caused the V2, uh, V2 um, uh, problem, right? Foramen ovale is V3, but it's okay. Yeah, the, yeah, but, that's right. That's right. That's right. These no, are corrected. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but the, the, so it's uh, you are right, Tibor. I've, or, as you know, I've done almost everything wrong that can be done, and I've uh, injected particles with particles. We never had a problem, but with glue and liquid embolics, I uh, it's very rare. We have cured many patients and, and cases. But uh, uh, we have also had complications. And if you have a 12th nerve complication, that's terrible because you lose that half is. the tongue and you it cannot is. talk, you cannot swallow. You can, so it's a terrible complication just because you, you know, very little thing. So it can be rare, but I would tell all the people who have never, who are here, maybe they are in, in, in the training program, uh, you, you should avoid it if you have a different solution uh, because it could be uh, very damaging uh, uh, to the patient. Um, so, but uh, yes, it's rare, but when it happens, it's really severe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. 
Okay. Uh, there were another uh, comment from David. No, sorry. Yeah, go and ahead. David Alchil had a comment. Um, David, um, in writing like this is a low risk fistula indication, presumably spousal tinnitus. So he's like, well, you know, is there room for like conservative management here? Active surveillance, whatever we want to call it. Right, David? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the question. I think, you know, that's uh, that's what I when I was looking at it. Maybe just watch this for a little bit. Yeah, so um the patient complained of really disabling postaltinus for six months. We we did not pursue any conservative management, but he was from coming to us from different state. Uh, so he's not like from uh, from Massachusetts, he's from New Hampshire. And he was really seeking uh, a cure for his uh, postal tinnitus. So we did not pursue any uh, conservative management or any... Uh, how, do you, how do you follow this conservatively? I mean, what are the... Other than the patient telling you, now I had enough of this noise, uh, let's treat it already. How do you... I mean, what is the end point of following these? Well, yeah. again, so these can be self-limiting and they can thrombose on their own uh, sometimes. I see. And then yeah, the yeah, second I part see. of my the second part of my question is, you know, you know, I've seen cures and people have reported cures doing manual compression of the jugular vein, um, and so that is a non-invasive approach to potentially treat this. You Does mean anyone have any vein or the occipital artery? Yes, this is something we used to do uh, many years ago because we did not have uh, um, any other possibility and we did not have uh, other uh, newer and, and more modern uh, techniques. I think that what uh, Muhammad did this in this case is really low risk and, uh, and it, it really solves a, a big problem for the patient. So um uh, this could not be done was not uh, doable you know uh, 30 years ago we, we did not we just injected something probably particles if uh, and whenever and we started saying yes but sometimes they thrombose by themselves especially the uh, cavernous sinus dural av fistulas and uh, we kept uh, you know uh, compressing arteries compressing the neck uh, for a while so there were these kind of things but they didn't really work uh, very well. Yes, they did in some cases, uh, but uh, now I think that the, um, uh, the the relationship between the risk and the, uh, what you can do is so much in favor of uh, of doing uh, that that uh, I would I would certainly in most cases uh, go for for a treatment rather than wait. So, I mean, certainly for CC Fischl, that's a different situation where you have different venous outflow um, patterns. And so this is a true extracranial fistula, right? This, as people were mentioning in the beginning that this is, you know, it's not, it's a question of whether this is even a dural fistula or not. Um, and so, you know, the primary outflow is the jugular vein, compressing the jugular vein. Really, I think in this particular case, has a high chance of, of, of achieving a, a treatment where you don't have to go transarterial, risk cranial nerve injury, or um, again, uh, anastomotic connections to the retriever basilar system, or even in the transvenous approach, which you had was temporary numbness in the hyperferent. So you can't say that this treatment is without risk. Yeah, but if- so Nothing. May I argue that if someone compress on the jugular, the outflow will be through the emissary vein. And I really, I mean, I don't know how long they're going to compress on their jugular. I mean, it was non-dominant side. Um, but it, sometimes those Wuxing sound patients, PT patients coming from a different state, they are really suffering to the point that they uh, um, they want treatment, right? But I agree with you. I probably the, the, the risk of those lesions are... Uh, uh, the hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic risk are very low because they are basically extracranial. But I think for those patients, just having this whooshing sound, it's just disabling enough. And unfortunately, we probably all have those patients that even they consider suicide because of those noise. So, uh, but uh, um, uh, the treatment is, yes, obviously we did not try transarterial, but the transvenous was uh, 
uh, was safe enough to 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 consider uh, to cure this lesion. I think this is a, a good price for the patient to pay. Uh, he, he actually never showed up to any follow up. We, I never had any angiographic follow up on him because I was so happy. Uh, I said, "Well, I feel great, you know." Uh, so I did not usually I do the six months or three to six months angiogram. Uh, but he never, he never showed up, obviously, he's from a different state. But I think uh, I agree with you, usually. And I've had actually over three, four years, had like four spontaneous resolution of fistula, mainly trans, trans, uh, uh, transverse sinus. So yeah, low-grade low grade fistula may spontaneously resolve. Uh, but my, my only question, I don't think it's a good idea to just compress the jugular vein. I probably... I know that patient, as Max asked in the beginning, that it's probably compression of the feeder, the occipital artery. Uh, that's probably more, because if you compress the jugular vein, they will just find another outflow. In this case, maybe the emissary vein. So maybe the compression would be, and in the past they used to do it, the compression of the occipital artery to treat. Uh, uh, but anyway, it was interesting. The other question here actually was, if I did use, um, had I used coiling in the in the occipital artery pouch and not the and did not do uh, the onyx and from the occipital artery, that was another question that I was just thinking that instead of those and eventually here the onyx you can see it in the occipital artery. So I think the question is if I had treated this just by coiling, and this is another good question to. Uh, to wonder about, you know, the efficacy of just treating this collector vein or artery or vessel instead of really going to the fistulous point. That's really, um, I mean, I was just retrospective thinking that if I had just put coils like like the other side here, right, this one, um, and this probably will increase the safety of procedure, but I don't know. Definitely, answer. you know, coils in the right place in the transvenous for fistulas are like the safest thing. I think one of the safest things you can do. A couple of comments, I think, from Kim, from Kim Nelson. He's under Olivia. Um, uh -huh. But you see, uh, Kim, I don't know if you can, if you have a microphone. Um, if you do, maybe you could comment. If not, I can, you guys go to the meeting chat and read what um, make some important points there. Kim, can you uh, speak? Okay, so just to, I think it would have been really interesting. You know, you did a dynamic angiogram with the finger on on the occipital. Now, if you if you again if you compressed the the jugular vein and did a, a, a dynamic angiogram under that circumstance, it would have been interesting to see what the how the fistula looked. But right. That yeah. that probably would have been yeah. predictable to to know whether manual compression would have been effective in this case. Yeah. No. That's unfortunately. Yeah. I was. I think. I did not do that. Yeah. That's a good point. It's just hard to. I mean, we'll, I guess we'll never know with this one. But um, I think just read up what what um, Kim was saying. I think in the in particularly like with the, with respect to the multiplicity of veins, there were like two. There were two veins that were coming from the second vein. I, I saw that too. Um, um, then, then the question is, and we've actually like always argued about this, um, could the apparent vein in the occipital embolization actually be a collecting artery that was accessed through the fistula? So that's always the question, like are these veins or arteries when you see like all of them converging on like this one big channel, maybe this is an artery. And we've argued amongst ourselves and in the wider sphere about it. and. Probably, um, you know, so far, I, I don't know if we have really an answer or if there is an answer for everything, for every case, but something to think about, like, um, are we in the artery or in the vein? But so, yeah, I read this AJNR and you uh, very nicely wrote about the artery versus vein, but I think for this, what kind of artery would be really, I'm just showing here, just like at the, at the door of the vein, it's closer to the venous side. I mean, we probably, I call it vessel, vascular con connect, collector, but at least angiographically, it looks closer to the venous side. Um, I agree. No, I agree. It looks closer to the venous side. And, and I think when we've raised that possibility, most people would say, nah, 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 they're vain. Like, you guys are like, yeah. this is not right. So, um, no, I, I, 
yeah, they certainly look more like veins. Um, and, you know, things are not obviously always what they look, um, appear to be, but, um, but I think this is something that we have to keep thinking about. Um, okay. Mohammed, thank you so much. In the interest of time, like there's more, we can talk about possible tinnitus too, so much. Um, thank you. Thank probably you. we should, thank you. Like, let's probably should move on. Um, and uh, Dodi, I think you're up next. And then we have, so if you guys can hang out, uh, we have a case by Dodi, and then we want to have a discussion. Um, Ibor has an interesting case to show um, that I hope you can stay for, and maybe we can get it. Um, you know, we, 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 we want to look at that because it's important. Max, I'm going to have to leave in about 15 minutes, but oh, I didn't okay. have time to prepare that case for presentation, so we'll have to do it next time. Oh, so, okay. So maybe we hold, okay, fine. I don't have imaging. I don't have imaging. Ah, I mean, okay, let's have imaging. Yeah, let's have imaging. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. let's let's hold off on that. And we won't say what it's about because it's good. Okay, Dodi, thank you. Uh, you're muted, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, we go back to the spine. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, I wanted to show you the case of this young lady, 15 year old, almost asymptomatic. She just has some tingling paresthesias in the right leg and occasional clumsiness in the right leg, but not, nothing much. And, but she does an MR and, and you can see her huge vessels in, in the lower uh, lumbar um, spine. We are in 2020 uh, and this is the section uh, or axial sections of the same thing. So you can see huge vessels, probably veins, and the spinal cord, which is uh, small and deviated on the right side. Nothing much is going upwards. I would say nothing really. Uh, what you can see is from the dorsal down, it looks like uh, the anterior spinal artery on the MR. And uh, the frontal sections gives you, you know, again, same thing. Uh, interestingly, what you can see is that the vein, uh, the draining vein is exiting the, uh, the, the, the spine at about L3. Um, so you have kind of a localized lesion between uh, C12 and L3. You will see it better, of course, uh, on uh, angio. This is the lateral view. And this is just to show you that maybe there was some little change in intensity in the spinal cord. So is this edema? Maybe yes, maybe not, not really symptomatic. Um, these are reconstructions uh, of the MR again, uh, to show that there are multiple vessels uh, going in and, uh, and the big uh, veins uh, in, uh, inside the spine. So. Finally, we did a spinal angiography in April 21, and you have a very huge high flow AV fistula. Uh, this is the left L2. So uh, the, the fistula is around L1, and uh, here is the AP view, and you see that the big vein is going down and then exiting and going to the uh, epidural, again, veins and paravertebral veins. Uh, this is a lateral view of the same thing. Difficult to have a very good uh, opacification because uh, injecting the contrast was so so high flow, so fast that uh, it was not really easy to inject uh, a good uh, amount of contrast. Uh, this is um, a, a, the oblique view of the same thing. I'll show you something that you will see better be, uh, later, that the big vessel going into the dura will divide into two branches, uh, uh, one more anterior than the other. Then this is the L1, uh, so above, just one segment above. And interestingly, you can see uh, the pedicles of the uh, vertebrae, which are remodeled by the presence of this mass, intra uh, spinal mass. Um, you will see it again, see here. Uh, and this is the uh, left T11. 
And finally, the anterior spinal artery at left T9. Um, on, when you inject the right L2, you will uh, see more or less the, the, the spinal cord, which is all on the uh, is, uh, pushed on the right side, remodeling the pedicles of the vertebrae. So this is the vaso CT, which is not very nice. I'm sorry, Aiton, because again, the contrast uh, would be so uh, diluted uh, because of the amount of flow in that region. Um, finally, we came to the treatment. Cody. Yes. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. For you and for the group, like to discuss this for the group. Yeah. You saw in the previous case, in, in, in Luca's case, a very, very tiny shunt, right? Yeah. There's a lot of edema, like cord edema, symptomatic. Like, and this is like, so the question that I want you, like, please discuss why this patient is minimally symptomatic with these ginormous things. And then somebody has like the tiniest dural fistula, even smaller than the one we saw, that's like, you know, he's paralyzed. So what's the, what, what's the problem? Well, it's it's. I think it's quite easy. Um, uh, the spinal cord suffers if it cannot work. Why should it not work? Because there is a problem with its vascularization, uh, both arterial or venous. In this case, everything happens outside the spinal cord, so it's just it belongs. Uh, it's just uh, you know, like the, a neighbor. But but really, it, it, the only problem is kind of a mass effect and the spinal cord is really mm, uh, dislocated and, and pushed on one side, but, but that's it. Uh, everything else, so the, the, the arterial uh, uh, arrival of blood to the spinal cord and uh, the venous the, the reflux, uh, uh, um, venous drainage of the spinal cord is, is not affected by this. So finally, uh, it's kind of a, uh, yeah, a, a neighbor, but not really, they're not intertwined, uh, the two things. So I think that's a, that's the reason, uh, and I don't think it's really um, a big question. It, a, 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 you might say it's like a, a tumor uh, on the side of the, of the spinal cord and uh, like a meningioma, which uh, little by little maybe grows, but uh, it really doesn't affect the the uh, physiology of the of the cord. I don't know if I answered uh, the, the question, but yeah. No, I don't know. If you want to add something, I fully but, agree with my master. But I could add that in this case, the the outflow was excellent from the spine. Exactly. So there is no engorgement of the venous uh, system of the cord. It's it's all um, um, it belongs to a different system. The but, comment by Kim also a nice demonstration of the importance of venous outflow, right? Which brings us to the question, like you mentioned, Dodi, that the cord suffers when the cord doesn't have perfusion, right? Right. Either not enough artery flow or not enough venous outflow. A dural or an epidural fistula is clearly a venous disease, right? right? The problem is venous congestion. So in an AVM or or like a, say, heel fistula or whatever, presumably, like the drainage of the cord is somehow independent of this, right? Or, I mean, it would, seem, it would probably have to be independent considering how much pressure there is in this vein. Um, but it is something that I think once I think it's an important question that we need to be sure. like people need to be thinking about. So we go to the treatment, and um, uh, these are the three main pedicles coming to the same uh, location. So I just wanted to highlight uh, one uh, uh, feeder to this point, one second feeder to that point, one third uh, in that region, which is more or less uh, connected. Then from the other pedicle, we have this. Then coming from above the anterior spinal artery is that. So if you put and that, is, and the vein is there. So all three come to the, more or less to this point. And then here you have the vein. So we decided to go through the red uh, uh, arteries 
um, uh, with two catheters, really. And we started to, to inject uh, the, through the microcatheter. And of course, you'll see nothing because of the high flow. The contrast is immediately very highly diluted. Um, but we we could understand a little bit just by going through what you know what what what, what was the way and then at a certain point you see that we are really going through very easily you know no, there are no um, uh, no points of no no um, curves uh, but everything is straight and 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 uh, you can reach the outflow vein very easily. Um, so we started as we usually do to place some coils, uh, but the coils in that high flow just they fly away. They cannot stay. We tried different sizes and things, but we knew we, they couldn't stay there. So finally, we came back and we started to put coils in the vein in more proximally. Um, and you see that there are two catheters there. So. Um, putting coils, putting coils, and we we started to uh, place coils. And then you can see that the flow now is uh, certainly uh, more um, slower. Uh, one artery is completely uh, shut down, uh, one branch of that artery. And now we have two catheters in, in two different positions. And we start injecting uh, uh, fill. Uh, to seal better the the whole um, occlusion uh, of the uh, of the vein. So now the vein the, the the we are here. The vein are still open, so there is some shunt too. And we started to see something that we didn't see before. So uh, occluding the main uh, veins, uh, of course, open the, the lesser veins. Uh, which are uh, connected, of course, uh, uh, because everything is is a network, and um, uh, but we kept uh, occluding more fill in the main draining vein, and uh, um, uh, finally you, those veins were really uh, uh, very well visible, the ones that we didn't see at the beginning. They're going up or upward. Um, so we had to take care of that now. We cannot leave something which is much worse than before now, because now we could have symptoms because we now we had redirected the, the shunt to uh, veins uh, of the spinal cord. So not good. Everybody, like I think it's a super important point to understand this. Yeah. That like leaving it at this point actually makes it worse. I hope everybody understands. Like, if you're if you're not like as doty, like, what what hap what's happening here, right? And it goes back to what Kim is saying and what we've been talking about. Presumably, like doty, do you think so? These veins that you're showing now, right, that we are yep. seeing, we presume that they you think they were draining like in an anti-grade quote fashion into the same big like pressurized fistulous vein before. Or what, like, what, or were they draining? Like, do we know? Like, were they draining somewhere else? These are really cord veins, right? Yeah. Uh, since they, uh, the appearance of these veins is, uh, they are dilated. Even if smaller, they are much bigger than the normal um, spinal cord veins. So I presume that they were already being used by the fistula. Uh, but of course, uh, you don't know exactly, and uh, you mm, you don't want it to be the the only drainage uh, remaining. Yeah, so no, I I'm not sure. I I don't. It may happen that normal veins drain in high flow veins. Of course, um, in this case, uh, I'm not sure because of the size, but uh, could be discussed. No, presumably, I agree with you. Presumably, they're not draining the cord. Like yeah. The other important point for the group is to understand that, like, the reason you see this is because the coils are not at the fistula site, right? Like, the coils are somewhere a little bit more distal from the fistula, right? So there, there are other veins that are that are basically coming into where closer to where the fistula is. These are the veins that you see above, and so the key is to continue the treatment. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, I'm not sure uh, we are not uh, the fistula. So I'm not uh, well. That's uh, it could be discussed. But uh, 
um, meaning that uh, you think there is just one whole fistula or is a multiple whole fistula. So uh, if, well, it, if it's one whole, yes, you're right. But if it's a multiple whole fistula, maybe, of course, multiple means uh, two or three, not, not 100. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yes. Either, yeah, sorry. Either way, we are not like we haven't closed yeah. Either the fistula or the fistula. Like, yeah. So that now it's it's worse, and now you start seeing many little veins even going downwards uh, along the cauda crina. Um, so no, no, not not good. We have to occlude it. So we push the catheter in the in that pouch, and uh, and then we 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 inject fill also in that pouch. So finally, everything is occluded. The final runs, nothing visible anymore. You see the artery to artery connections. Uh, you see it better, maybe, I don't know, so L, no, yeah. And um, this is the cast at the end, fill and cause everywhere. You don't see exactly where the spinal cord could stay inside the, inside the spine. There is no more room, but finally, Luckily, she was clinically unchanged, and we had MNMR control at four days pre-discharge, which shows maybe a little bit of edema again, uh, at the, more or less at the same site as before. AP view or coronal view, same thing, a little bit of edema, and uh, everything else is, uh, is just coils and fill. No more symptoms after three months, follow up, no more edema, no, neither. So again, I, I know we are running out of time. So this is before where there was some edema. This is for three months follow up. So we were very happy. And finally, she sent a postcard uh, six months later. She was trekking on the Alps, 15 kilometers, no pain before, during, or after. So this is a, a, a good story. Uh, the, 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 the case I just wanted to show because it, it, it had some you know, anatomical points uh, to be considered. Uh, and even uh, if high flow fistula, but I think endovascular treatment is at its best in AV plus. <laughs> And, and 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 we started there 50 years ago, and there is a reason. So we should really, when there is an AV fistula, we are the ones that have to be uh, to know what to do, to understand what what happens, to to understand what's artery, what's vein, where where, where it is, and and act accordingly. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Dodi. That's uh, awesome. Uh, just, just to make sure we, when you say endovascular edema is at best with AV fistulas, you, you, you don't include the dural fistulas, right? <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> no, it's, it's <laughs> right. No, it's AV fistulas everywhere. Okay. So not, not even neuro, maybe in, uh, even you know in the leg or uh, whatever. Um, uh, but dural AV fistulas, yes. In the in the skull and in the um, the cranial uh, there are levi fistulas yes and and certain that's the best in spinal levi fistula we could do better that's the, my point so we, yeah, yeah, we yeah. more or less we endovascular treatment of spinal levi fistula has a medium um, um, advantage and, and a possibility of cure. Uh, surgery has the 99% uh, uh, success. So that's why we, we prefer surgery. But of course, if there were not surgery, uh, yeah, that's it. So now how do you call this fistula? You call it a PL, uh, yeah. A PL fistula? Yeah. Okay. PL, PL meaning that it's on the surface of the spinal cord. Yeah. So, but but it's it's a monster uh, AV fistula, of course. Uh, the the we have seen many smaller uh, and interestingly, as, as Max was saying before, very low clinically uh, symptomatic, and and uh, even if it's a huge thing. So yeah, uh, that's also a, an interesting part of the. Of the uh, case. Now on that uh, minimally symptomatic uh, and treatment, um, you know. Um, what is the natural history of this, right? 
um, like if you don't do anything, is that a consideration not to do anything here? Um, I I think uh, you know in a patient of 15 years old with this, uh, I I uh, with still symptoms, you know, as much as it wasn't that bad, she was not uh, able to walk normally. So I would say it's it's symptomatic, but uh, even if asymptomatic, like what what do we think about treatment of this? Like, do we think conservative is an option here, or regardless, we would all? Go I really and... don't. I really don't think so. But I am very happy to to hear a voice which is uh, opposite to mine, um, uh, because this is. If you look at this, well, uh, I don't think this would remain asymptomatic or uh, for a long time. For a long time. Yeah. And no, I agree. I, I'm. I'm completely with you. I also Anybody? Agree with you, this is a high risk lesion, you know, one way or the other, either from compressive symptoms or hemorrhage. And and for me, this is this is not a case for conservative management. Yeah. Okay, good. Anybody thinks differently, like connected? Um and uh, any or any other comments? Yeah, I mean, my, my only comment was, you know, it's it's just so hard to know, you know, after you did you did an amazing case, amazing job, and you still have some edema, you know, how do we know, like, whether or not to supplement that with some sort of decompressive spine surgery to, you know, improve the chance for a good outcome? It's just hard to know when that is needed, I think, in these cases. Uh, I'm interested to hear if anyone, you know, you know, when do you pull the trigger to do any sort of additional decompressive type surgery? In other words, do we think the edema is from compression or the edema is from venous compromise? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's a question, right? How do you know the difference? And how, you know, and would that change, you know, what kind of treatment you would do? I, I, I usually think that once you um, occlude uh, the fistula, even if you have placed the coils so that people would think now you have a, a, a increased the, the mass effect, really, no, it doesn't happen, uh, especially because what you obtain is, uh, is that you stop the pulsation of this high flow thing, uh, which is the one I think that really uh, the spinal cord doesn't like the, the continuous boom, 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 boom uh, uh, on its side. So you stop that, even if it's a little bit more bigger than before, it certainly does not, it, it's much better for the spinal cord. So if we did something was because we occluded some veins, smaller veins that the, that the spinal cord was uh, utilizing. Um, but finally, no, I think everything went well because of course, uh, you need some luck, and uh, and, uh, and it was a little bit lucky. But uh, certainly, what we did was we we thought we were doing the right thing because we we were just occluding the vein, and um, and at the level of the of the shunt, uh, which is you know the, the, what we what we should do. Kim Kim had a point on the chat saying if symptoms worsen, like let's say she woke up with much worse symptoms then maybe take her to surgery then um, presumably yeah i mean that that makes sense mass effect. Um, that makes sense and i think it's important you know say you couldn't get you know the curative result that you did and you still had bad you know you know the bad venous outflow in the spinal cord i think that's certainly also an indication for, for surgery yeah we have, we have had not really simple AV fistula, but let's say more AVM-like in the same location. And we, we have a very good collaboration with our surgeon. And we did the pre-op embolization in, in two of these cases and then surgery and uh, with very good results. So we are very happy of the way we uh, we approach these, these lesions in the lower cord um you know both uh, uh with directly with um uh embolization and uh, uh with, with collaboration with the surgeon so you, you could even if it looks you know like a, a huge something a monster that you cannot even go nearby 
finally uh, know it, it's it's feasible. It goes back to what we always talk about. Like you have to understand where the target is, right? This whole thing is predicated on understanding the the the, the target. Yeah. Um, the safety, as much as you said, like we got lucky. I would have, I would, I would have been so scared to do this story. I I tell you, like to think of, as much as I agree, like totally with your analysis of where I think we need to put the coils or whatever and where the shunt is. God, like to know how the cord is draining after we do this and like what's going to happen. It's really like a lot of space <laughs> in the end. I guess we have to have the courage of our convictions and knowing where the lesion is, but particularly in spine, like consequences can be so terrible. Yeah. Um, a comment from Nishan, um, transvenous with coils fills onyx. So question like, could this be done transvenous? Um, we well, did it transvenous, we did it we dragged in the vein through the artery. So we were in the vein, uh, and, and it was easier to come there, to get there with, through the artery rather than coming from the, the inner side. So, yeah. So Particularly with peel fistulas, right? Like, the, like peel fistulas sometimes are just like simple, relatively speaking, they can be like really big, but the shunt itself is like straight hole. Um, or maybe a few holes, but probably one hole. Um, um, and um, yeah, Kim says the connections are like in continuity. You're embolizing through the anterior spinal, posterior spinal. It's a um, um, fantastic result. <laughs> fantastic result, really. Um, and I think, whatever, what, can, what more can I say? Like, young person like this deserves i think someone who really like has tremendous experience with some, these sorts of lesions um to, to have the best chance of what we can do um any other comments um kim's comment transfistula approach so he is agreeing with you though you like you come to the venous side thanks kim um, <laughs> yeah um Okay. Um, <clears throat> listen, thank you so much, everyone. I think we'll, you. Uh, we'll stop here. Um, and um, thank you, thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to the presenters. Like the cases were like so fantastic today. Um, really awesome. Um, and there's more, of course, more later. So we'll keep, you know, we'll see you hopefully in a few, like, you know. We have the date of months. the next one uh, already established, Max? No, no, we have maybe something coming. Uh, we'll see how, like, presumably, like, we're doing, like, sort of quarterly, so maybe whatever, around September. Um, we have something coming up anyway. Um, uh, oh, yeah. oh, wait, well, hold on, Hima. I'm sorry, Hima has a case. Ah, can we stay for one more? Yeah, Hima, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize, I, I see, first, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. Ah, uh, my apologies. No. He might have the case. No, no. Um, yes. Am I, am I audible? Max? Let's do it. No, let's do it. Let's do it. Just five minutes, Max. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, go. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hello, Hello everybody. So, uh, Dr. Dodi, this is in continuation with what you presented, and just that the pathology is a little different, and I thought that's the reason I would wanted to just present it today in continuation. So, um, yeah. One minute. So uh, this the patient is also a young lady, 26 year old, unmarried, working as an HR manager in an IT company. Uh, slight difficulty in walking since January 2022, but otherwise fairly well preserved. Her first MR was done in April 2022. I don't have the films of that, but it remains more or less unchanged. The second MR was done in November 22, followed by an angiogram within a few days of the MRI. So this is the MR, the T2-weighted image, quite like what we just saw, what just you just shared. And these are the uh, sagittal images that we have. And we do see a lot of veins, which are seen predominantly in the uh, lower thickle sac, just the anidus as the cord ends here. 
and these are the veins in the parasitical sections. These are the axial sections that we have. And uh, there's a slight cord edema, a little more uh, towards the cranial part. And then we have these veins, which are on the left side and more posterior laterally on the left side uh, on these images. These are the uh, dilated venous uh, channels, what we are seeing here all around and then uh, low down in the thecal sac. These are the only actual images that I have for this uh, case. So uh, the patient had uh, the, a spinal angio following this MRI and the cord, we, as we saw in the MR, was ending at D12. Um, these are the selective runs that we have. That's the right D9. That's the right D9 again. And that's the right L1. That's the feeder to the AVM that we see. So that's the posterior spinal artery coming up all the way. And then we have these uh, um, undulations in the feeding vessel. And then that's the AVM, the nidus, which is being filled partly from the uh, right uh, L1, uh, PSA coming from the right L1. The next one is the left L1. And So what we saw here in the left L1 is that the anterior spinal artery coming, it divides into two uh, branches and then it again unites to form the anterior spinal artery, which feeds the AVM nidus. Uh, that's the left uh, D9. Again, that's a posterior spinal artery. Uh, which also has uh, origin uh, associated to with it uh, the, of the anterior spinal artery as well. So left D9 also gives the uh, and, uh, part of the anterior spinal artery. Uh, that's left D12, I guess. From uh, so there's some filling of the feeder of the from the left ASA across the anastomosis here on the left. So the ABM was spanning two vertebral bodies, D11, D12. So it was, by, was a, a secondary supply, I would say. And also from the left D12, which was also again the anastomosis coming via the anastomosis. So there were three PSAs, two at D9 level, one on the right, one on the left, and one on the right from L1. There were two ASAs, both on the left, one from D9 and one from D uh, L1. Again, looking at it the other way, there were uh, D9 had was giving uh, feeders to the ASA and PSA, whereas from the L1, we had one PSA on the right and one ASA coming from the left. So these were basically the feeders that we had. So I just had a diagrammatic representation made of all the, all the vessels together. So this is the PSA, which is coming from the right L1. And I'm sorry for this one, but the PSA comes and then supplies the nidus. This is the PSA, which comes from the right D9 the PSA which comes from left D9, and that's the anterior spinal artery, which also had some supply coming to the nidus. The predominant supply though is from the left L1, uh, the anterior spinal artery, and the venous drainage is going accordingly. Uh, the doubt that I had about how to go ahead with the treatment was, given the two limbs of the anterior spinal artery, which were very small in caliber, was it safe enough to access through these vessels? On the same, on the, uh, on, on the right as well, so uh, that's the close-up of the same thing, a zoomed in view. Uh, and on the right side, again, this was the posterior spinal artery with the tortuous course that it had. So was it again safe enough to go through this artery and attempt a partial embolization uh, was the doubt that I had. So given my experience, I was not very sure about going either uh, through either of these uh, vessels which were supplied. And I was not sure if going through this vessel would really do justice to the treating the AVM, even if it would have been a partial one. So I'm presenting this case for opinion from everyone here. It's certainly very difficult case to manage. I don't think we can achieve a cure with embolization through the endovascular treatment. Uh, and so the discussion is, is it worth to do a partial embolization in these cases? Um, I don't think so really, unless there has been a, a hemorrhage, which has not been there. 
Um, so the way we would uh, consider uh, an approach here would be to discuss it with the surgeon, as we said before, um, and see if there is a, a possibility to do a, a complete uh, eradication with you know, with uh, with uh, both endovascular and surgical approach, because the partial something I don't think it's really a solution. Uh, it it has no uh, real doesn't change the natural history of the of the lesion of the case on one side, and it has a very high risk of complication on the other side. So if you go there, if we would go there, it, it would be because we consider we can get to a a complete cure. Otherwise, I, I don't think we would do it. Yeah, so, that, uh, so I also thought that probably I would not go ahead with the case. And as of now, I haven't done any uh, immunization for the patient as of now. So yeah, thank you for your opinion. Yeah. But do you, do you have a, a surgeon who could approach this? Uh, because that's the point. It should be done in a, in a multi-specialty um, uh, endeavor um, uh, situation. So I don't know if if uh, if that is possible. Uh, and, and of course, you you would need to study very well and deeply the MR to see exactly where these vessels are, because most often these are on the surface of the spinal cord. If they are um, peripheral to the spinal cord, then it's it's really possible to to take it a, a, with, with surgery. But if they are deep inside the spinal cord, uh, of course, it's much more difficult. And, um, and that's the real, the, the, the most important uh, thing to, to see uh, and to uh, manage, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, um, so it's surgery, but surgery after having very well understood the, the relationship between the vessels and the spinal cord. Yes. Thank you. Um, there was, uh, I see there was Max answered to this question on online um, from Nishant about, the, he was questioning, there was an MRI um, and he was uh, talking about this to be a possible hemangioblastoma. Mm -hmm. um, any other comment? I agree with Dodi. I think it's com it's a complex lesion. I, it's not a it's not a PO fistula as as yeah. Dodi's case was. This is I think it's a conus AVM. Yeah. Um, and or whatever an AVM. Uh, uh, it seems like the one thing that I think is maybe a little good is that um, a, the big there's like a couple of big posterior spinal feeders, right? Like I think yeah. it's important to see the difference, like this is a posterior spinal, as Hema said um, here. Um, and so the anterior spinal, I think is less, I don't know, it seems like it might be more located on the um, dorsal surface, potentially. Might be more accessible surgically, I don't know. Um, um, we have done, like we've kind of like moved to doing Dyna CTs or Vaso CTs or whatever you call it, whatever you have on these. So. If you have the capability to do that, I think it's very helpful, like really helpful to un to to understand um, more about it. Um, but of course, you don't always have that. Um, we do we do have the facility, Max, but somehow it was missed uh, for this patient, uh, and it was not done. We really regret that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say if you're going to do something, I would bring back and do it. Um, yeah. And sometimes what. We, we haven't done a dynant like that yet, or maybe we have, I don't remember, but we have done in the past, like just bilateral groin, like catheters, put the, each catheter in like the two biggest feeders or the ones that you want to know, and then like do simultaneous injections that can help, can be helpful if there is yeah. like competing inflow or like the ones that, at least the Siemens, you can fuse the dynas from a, two different injections. It gets to be a little bit like, into like a lot of imaging, but I think sometimes it can help. Yeah. Um, so 
somebody asks if, if you can uh, show the MR images again to yes. go to the start of the presentation. So we did not have a contrast MR at this point of time. I think Nishant is asking, like, could this be something else? It like didn't... a major blastoma or some other, like, say, it's like a tumor, solid a mass with cord it, it expansion. So. Yeah, yeah uh, it didn't seem so on the images that we had. Of course, we don't have a contrast with us as of now, but it didn't seem to be a tumor with uh, a neoplastic vessels, like not a neoplastic lesion, basically. Important consideration. I mean, it looks we have like an AVM. It looks like an AVM. Can you show the next uh, image? Because it, it looks also that it's really superficial. Next uh, next image. Yeah. So it looks like it's on the side of the spinal cord. If if said it, okay, do you agree with me? Yes, yes. It does look like on the, on the surface of the cord on the left. On the surface, exactly. So may, maybe it's really approachable surgically. Uh, you have another image, uh, next one. Yeah. yeah, this is below. Okay, it doesn't really matter. I think from a surgical perspective, you have to have like a very experienced spinal surgeon. For the of course, of course. But they're it, like, they're going to look as bad as this looks in the OR. This looks like a terrible, horrible mess. Um, and, and. But uh, once they learn that, what they really should do is to remain outside the spinal cord. Don't touch the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Just look at the vessels and coagulate uh, the, the, the vessels, uh, the abnormal vessels on the surface of the cord and, and both arteries and veins. Uh, this is uh, something that um, Spetzler, Robert Spetzler explained uh, a few years ago. And um, it looks like it's really, it works. You, you, it, the risk, of course, is very high. But if you stay, uh, if you don't touch <laughs> the spinal cord with your, uh, you know, surgically, but just stay on the surface and just little by little occlude the vessels, you can, you can get very good results. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is the case, but uh, if, if it were... Uh, well studied uh, and to to confirm that all these vessels are really not inside the cord but on the surface i i think it could be uh, amenable to surgery yeah i i'll review that i uh, maybe i can call the patient back and do a 3d and then review the entire anatomy and then discuss with our surgeons if uh, what is their opinion about it okay yes and if they need an endovascular help maybe you might treat the part which comes from the anterior spinal artery, which is the one that for the surgeon is more difficult to approach because it's uh, anterior. And uh, and so maybe if you could do like a, a very tiny little occlusion of the uh, part of the AVM, which is fed by the anterior spinal artery, uh, that would be helpful for the surgeon. And then the rest, uh, he will take care of it. But again, it's not easy. Eh? I'm, I'm just saying that, that that's something that uh, has been done. Yeah. Great. yeah thank so, you so, so much. From Max, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for staying a bit extra. Another, another great case. And we are really like, we, we really had a great session. Um, Ima, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, as always. Um, we will be back soon, hopefully, like maybe like about three months around September. Um, we'll send you dates um, as they come. And um, if there's anything, you know, we have, we're always like, there's all these cases online. We post cases, on, obviously, on the website. Anything awesome comes up, um, another place to, to put them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay Thank safe. You. Take care. Have a good day.